good morning. Good morning. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome on this Lord's Day. Welcome to this time of fellowship, of worship, of centering ourselves and resting in God's grace. The God of grace who has met us, encountered us, claimed us, named us, and embraced us as God's own beloved children in Jesus Christ. Welcome to one and all. Uh, as we, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you will, prepare your hearts and your minds to worship the living God. The call to worship from Psalm 112. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the one that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Friends, let us worship God.
Through the testimony of those who know your love, you have guided us to ask for what we need. Our Lord Jesus called us as disciples to live as a city set on a hill and a lamp on a stand that all would see your glory. And so we gather today, this day set aside to worship and adore you. And so as we gather here in this congregation, we pray for the church universal, the church everywhere in all times and places. We pray for this community of disciples. Grant that we who claim the name of Christ may shine as light into our dark world. And living God, you told us through the Apostle Paul that the world would not be persuaded by the good news of Jesus Christ through lofty words of human wisdom, but by wisdom born of your Spirit. And so we pray for those who serve the church and ask that pastors and teachers and missionaries uh, would seek after your eternal truth and would share that eternal truth, which is your saving love with all they encounter. We confess that you have blessed us and blessed the world through your commandments. And so we pray for our world, for the governments and for the leaders of all nations. We ask that all who rule, all who serve the people would do so with justice and compassion and would serve the common good that all people would flourish and know the abundant life that you desire for all. You teach us in your word to offer food to the hungry and to satisfy the needs of those who are afflicted. And we pray for the, the sick, and the hungry, the poor, the homeless, and those who are in any way in trouble. And we remember and we name for you in their particular circumstances, whatever the challenge may be for them, Diane and Mike, William, and Beverly, Levi, Jackie, Dick, and James. And in the sacred silence together, we make known to you that joy, that concern, that dream, that sorrow that we bring with us to this time of worship today. Eternal God, as we end this service today and head out into the world, we pray that you would allow us to truly be little Christ, to be the body of Christ, his heart, hands, feet, and voice to this world you love. And so to you, O God, our Father, we pray through Christ, with Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. And we do so even as we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And the next hymn of today's worship service, hymn number 113, Rejoice, Ye Pure in Heart.
be seated. Uh, we come now to the, the lectionary, one of the lectionary readings, the gospel lesson for this Lord's Day. Uh, it's Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. As we come to listen for what the Spirit, the Holy Spirit might be saying to the church and to each one of us, let us pray. O Lord, open our understanding by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as this, your word is proclaimed, we may receive your wisdom to understand the gifts that you have bestowed on us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So Matthew chapter 5, running from verses 13 through verse 20. Listen for God's holy and inspired word to you. Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches other to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Friends, may God bless the reading and hearing of this portion of his inspired word. Amen. Airspace. 
of the Federal Aviation Administration, Homeland Security, the Department of Defense, all have requirements for entry. Uh, entry into, into U.S. airspace or flying over uh, military installations or other sites all have requirements. And in the instance of the Chinese spy balloon, those entry requirements were certainly unmet. But turning to today's text, we are in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. To treat the text briefly, Jesus, using metaphorical language, tells us we ought to be like salt and light in the world. That is, we are to live lives that help others and to reflect our faith in God. And Jesus then assures, in kind of a pivot, Jesus assures his listeners that he is not abolishing the law. Rather, Jesus affirms the law ought to be kept. And Jesus concludes his remarks in this section of Matthew 5, in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, by saying, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So is, is Jesus, who so often in his parables points to the free grace of God for flawed men and women, is Jesus reversing himself here and telling us that we must earn or merit our salvation by a perfect observance of the law? If, if sin has ruptured our relationship with a holy God, are we able to mend or restore that relationship by keeping the law? Is that what Jesus is telling us? Uh, if you want to get into the Arnold Center to see a concert or a theater production, if you want to get into the Paul Brown Acor Stadium to see a Bengals game, or into Kings Island for a summer visit, you will in each instance need uh, a ticket or a pass. Perhaps you remember uh, entering college or helping a child or a grandchild navigate the entrance requirements for a university. Now, the school may have looked at high school grades and extracurricular activities, a grade point average, SAT scores, volunteer service, and maybe an essay, references. Now, maybe a family member had previously attended the school. Getting into a university can be challenging with its requirements. The same goes for something like military service. Not, not just anyone gets in. There are hoops to jump prior to being accepted into the service. Diagnostic and aptitude tests. Uh, the day was, uh, more often than not, that there couldn't be a legal record, or maybe something like tattoos, uh, or maybe today, gang affiliation. Uh, medical problems can exclude you, allergies, or flat feet, or poor, very poor vision. The different branches of the U.S. military have their own entry requirements for new recruits. And then, more abstractly, uh, there are requirements or standards for entering into marriage or into any sort of healthy relationship, things like honesty or open communication or mutual respect or concern for the other person. The idea that of, of entry requirements, if you want to play around with that idea, the idea of entry requirements then is not foreign to our thinking. When Jesus talks about an entry requirement for the kingdom of heaven, we get it, I think. Uh, John Ortberg sort of mused about entry requirements in an article he wrote, and, and he used uh, the illustration of a scene from the Monty Python movie, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, King Arthur and his knights seek the Holy Grail. They come to a bridge that spans the river of death. The bridge keeper allows people to cross this bridge only if they can answer three questions. Get one wrong and you're tossed into the pit. Uh, Lancelot is the first to test the bridge keeper. The keeper asks him, what is your name? Lancelot answers. And then the question, what is your quest? Lancelot says, to seek the Holy Grail. And then the question, what is your favorite color? Blue. Right, says the bridge keeper, off you go. Lancelot crosses the bridge, amazed that it was so easy. The second knight similarly states his name in his quest, but the third question is now, what is the capital of Assyria? I, I don't know that. And suddenly the knight is hurled, screaming into the abyss. Finally, the king, King Arthur, steps up. What is your name? Arthur, king of the Britons. What is your quest? To seek the Holy Grail. What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? What do you mean, says King Arthur, an African or European swallow? What? I 
don't know, answers the bridge keeper, who is immediately himself launched into the abyss. Arthur and his followers thereafter cross the bridge unhindered. All that is to say, many people have the idea that we one day come to a, a, a bridge to heaven and are asked to produce the right theology or enough good works that we hand over and produce to get in, to merit our way in. But Jesus is telling us something a little different in today's scripture lesson, I think. There is a bridge to cross that takes us across the gulf of sin from a flawed humanity to a perfect God, from humanity into the kingdom or the reign of God. But there are no riddles or theology tests. The culmination and the climax of this section of Matthew 5 is the concept of righteousness. Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven indeed has an entrance requirement and that it is essentially a perfect righteousness. Righteousness is not a common word we use nowadays. Uh, it refers kind of uh, to one's legal standing before the law. The Pharisees and the scribes were concerned to be righteous by punctiliously observing the law of Moses, and beyond the law of Moses, observing as well a lot of extra rules that were set up to make sure that you never even got close to violating the law. And Jesus says the entry requirement for the kingdom of heaven, then, is an observance of a law that goes beyond even the Pharisees. And that ties in, verse 20 ties in, I think, to the rest of what follows in Matthew 5, where Jesus explains that keeping the law means keeping the law in every particular and observing the law not just in one's actions, but in one's thoughts, in, in the heart. You can't slip up in word or deed or thought. God looks not just at what we do, but at our hearts. It, so it seems to me, taking into account the broad sweep of what Jesus tells us in the Gospels and, and then what the Apostles go on to explain in their New Testament epistles, that meeting that standard is, for each one of us, impossible. The point Jesus is making in verse 20 today is, I think, the impossibility of the entry requirement. Telling us that the standard for entry into God's realm is our own righteousness is meant to throw us back on the grace of God. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So if it, if it is our righteousness that gets us into the kingdom of heaven, then we know that we are not getting in. That, that is a ticket we cannot produce, a standard we cannot meet. And I think that is the point that Jesus is making. We can strive to be salt and light, but we know we won't always do so perfectly. We can do our best to keep the moral law and deed and, and thought, but I suspect we know that we will, each one of us, at least occasionally fail. Perfection is not an attainable goal. And that's the direction that Jesus goes later in chapter 5. Jesus presses the, the kind of antithesis between the standard of the law and then our ability or our lack of ability to keep the law. If if we must keep not just the law, but the spirit of the law, pure and perfect in thought, word, and deed, who of us indeed shall be saved? So the point Jesus is making is to cut out from underneath us all of our own self-satisfaction and self-righteousness. It's then, I suspect, aware of who we really are, who we really are before God, that we might do some good as salt and light. Not because we're, we're better than others or we're righteous than others, but because we have discovered God's grace in Jesus Christ. So we, do, we don't minimize our sin or hide from it or equivocate or qualify it, but admit to ourselves and confess to God our failings and our imperfections. But it's in that admission, in that acknowledgement that we are flawed, that we encounter a grace stronger than our sin. It's when we acknowledge our sin that we can then accept the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 tells us that for our sake, He, God, made Him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. So the bridge across the divide of sin that separates us from God is Jesus. 
There's no riddle. There's no test. There's just faith in the bridge. Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the love and the mercy and the forgiveness that he disclosed to us in his life. There is the bridge. In Romans chapter 10 verse 4, Paul writes, Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law for us. We're called to observe the law. The law of God is good. It's a standard for behavior to help and to guide. Our Christian life is to be marked by a transformation that sees us grow to be more and more like Christ, more loving and merciful and kind. But the scriptures are clear that imperfect human beings will be unable to live perfectly and so require God's mercy and love and forgiveness and grace. When we trust in Christ, then the scriptures tell us when God looks at us, God sees not our own imperfections, but the righteousness of Christ who stands in our place before God. There in Christ, the entry requirement for the kingdom of heaven is met. You may, you may need good grades and a well-crafted essay to get into a good university. You probably need a ticket or a season pass to get into a Bengals game or a theme park. You should probably clear some things like your flight plan and a manifest with the FAA if you're flying into international uh, airspace into, into the U.S. But for entrance into the kingdom of God, into the dream of God, into the realm of God, into the kingdom of heaven, it is the perfect righteousness that we find in Jesus that is the gracious gift of God given to us. There is the entry requirement. It is the righteousness imputed to us by faith in Christ. Imputation means to ascribe or to assign. And so when we trust in Christ, when we rest in the saving love that he showed us in his life and in his death and in his resurrection, it is that perfect righteousness that God sees. The saving love of Jesus finds us now, too, coming to his table. And so we move from the word proclaimed to the word handled and seen and smelled and tasted. And so as we come to the table, as we come to the Lord's table, let us taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Friends, brothers, and sisters, hear these words of invitation. Jesus said, Come unto me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus tells the church, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to them and eat with them and they with me. And the scripture is full of invitations. From Genesis to Revelation, the ministry of Jesus was characterized by invitations to meals, to parties, to gatherings around a table prepared for a meal. The scriptures tell us that the kingdom of heaven will find men and women coming from north and south and east and west to feast in God's kingdom. And so there's something about a shared feast, about a generous welcome, about a robust hospitality that finds an analog in the kingdom of God, in the reign of God in, in heaven, in that life beyond the horizon of this life. That invitation is given to one and to all to this foretaste of that heavenly meal. And so to all who find in Jesus a perfect Savior, to all who would trust in love and mercy and grace, to sinner and saint, to believer and doubter, the invitation is extended. Come to the table that Jesus has prepared for each one of you. He is the host. Come. And so as we do come to this table that Jesus has laid out for us, hear these words of institution shared by the Apostle Paul. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And so let us pray. Almighty God, you created all that is. You made covenant promises with human beings. 
you gave us your law. You called your people back to yourself when they strayed. In the fullness of time, you gave your Son in fulfillment of prophecy and your promise not to condemn but to save. As we gather now around bread and cup, we ask that as we set aside these common elements to special purpose, we ask that you would bless them by your Holy Spirit to our benefit. May these elements be for us the body and blood of Christ, recalling for us his once for all sacrifice on the cross and his trampling down of sin and death for our sake. Allow this time to be for us a communion with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and a communion with your Son living and reigning with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever, in whose name we pray. Amen. And Jesus took bread. Paul tells us he, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Cup this bread, friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And, and as has become our custom, if you'll take your disposable chalice, removing the foil from the bread. Friends, the body of Christ given for you, receive this in faith. Same way, uh, remove the foil from the chalice, the cup, the wine. As the cup of the new covenant, the cup of grace, sealed with the very life's blood of Christ, receive this likewise in faith. pray. Holy God, giver of all good gifts and blessings, we thank you for this supper calling us to enact and to remember the sacrifice of your Son, our Savior. May the bread and cup that we have shared be for us a spiritual nourishment and sustenance for our souls. Empower us by your Spirit in this meal to embody Jesus for others until he comes again. Our concluding hymn and our sending hymn for this Lord's Day, hymn number 589, singing again the first and the last stanzas, stanzas one and four of 589, O Master, let me walk with thee.
several scripture selections uh, here to receive this benediction. Go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, return no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, brothers and sisters, go in peace to love and serve the Lord, now and evermore. Hallelujah and Amen. Thank you.